What's up, everybody? Brad here. It is the end of the week yet again, July 12th, and we are wrapping up the world of technology with a little bit of focus on Microsoft this week because, well, mostly every week, but Microsoft is having a partner conference next week, and a lot of news is coming out, and so there's been a lot of questions this week. There's a lot of just a lot of stuff going on, but we're going to kick it off with some of this Microsoft partner stuff because I find it very interesting. So Microsoft announced this week that they're ending the internal use rights for its partners. Now, if you don't know what this is, this is means that Microsoft's partners who are reselling things like Office and Azure and all sorts of services could previously use all of Microsoft software for effectively no charge. Now, Microsoft is coming out and saying, hey, back in the day when we used to run all on-premises software, this wasn't a big deal. We'd ship you a CD or whatever and a license, and then you'd go install it, and, and that's it, right? Microsoft kind of washed their hands of it. In this new cloud world, Microsoft is saying, hey, when you're running all that stuff on our cloud, it is actually costing us money every single month. And for companies that are using, that are very heavily invested in this, this is becoming a problem Microsoft is pitching because it, right, it's no longer free for them. Now, there's a lot of things you can kind of spin this. If you're a partner, obviously this makes you pretty angry because what used to be free, uh, or used to, yeah, what used to be free is now gonna cost you potentially thousands of dollars a month, right? Who, who wants to just take on that cost? So there's a couple of different ways to look at this. Microsoft spin is that, hey, you got to start paying for what you're using because we're incurring that cost. But then the partners are also arguing, it's like, hey, we're selling your stuff. The more we know about all of your other products other than the, the specific one we're selling, the better for you. And now we're going to have to pull that stuff back because, hey, we're going to start looking at cost efficiencies here. Why would we pay for Dynamic 365 when something like HubSpot would work? Why would we pay for Office 365 when we're selling Azure services and Google Docs will work. It, it's going to be a lot of push and pull here. I'm curious to see uh, how this eventually shakes out, if this really does impact Microsoft sales long term, because they talk about how much they love their partners right up until it starts costing them money. Now, you could also make the argument too that Microsoft is the most valuable company in the world, or always it, it, it has been. You know, it fluxes between Microsoft and Apple and, and whatever, but they're usually in the top five. And for them to be able to incur this cost, that is not a big deal. They make billions of dollars in net income every quarter. And this feels like it just kind of like screwing, turning that screw just a little bit further. And it might be a little bit unnecessary to make your partner ecosystem, which you're so heavily dependent on, non well, I shouldn't say non-existent, but just unhappy. We will see. I don't think this story is done yet. We will see if Microsoft ever reverses course, but we will find out. Microsoft also announcing this week that its Teams platform now has 13 million daily active users. I, I really like Teams. Um, it's an interesting product, but if you compare it to Slack, Slack, which has a rough value market of about $17 billion uh, as of well yesterday morning, Microsoft's Teams has more people, which means it should be worth doing basic math here, about $22 billion if it was a standalone product. Slack told us that they had 10 million active users, but that was back in January. Obviously, it's somewhat higher today, or at least it should be somewhat higher today. So it's not a perfect comparison, but Microsoft is obviously touting the fact that their communications platform, which is a little over two years old, has 13 million active users. It, that is not inconsequential. I mean, that's a pretty big deal for Microsoft. Microsoft also released this week uh, Windows 10 build 18936 with a few minor features and fixes. One of the big things they are introducing into this is now passwordless login using things um, like Windows Hello or a pin. They're really starting to push this that, hey, passwords are a thing of yesterday. You need to start figuring out a way to move away from them once you authenticate a device. So uh, just be kind of on the lookout for that. Obviously, that is on the fast ring and may not show up until 20H1 because that is technically not a 19H2 build. So that is uh, a little bit longer of a lead time. Other things happening. Microsoft is planning to shut down Remix 3D. If you are not familiar with Remix 3D, you are not alone. Microsoft launched this as a companion to Paint 3D, which was announced with the Creators Update a couple years back. They devoted a lot of time to Paint 3D. Obviously, this marketplace is kind of online collaboration area is it taking off but walking cat found information and then other people were able to easily confirm that hey microsoft is going to sunset that and just move away from it which is a little interesting because microsoft needs a lot of 3d related content uh, for their hololens and all that stuff or maybe they just don't see a long or like a future with the consumer on this platform i really think remix 3d was kind of that nesting egg for them to build up 3d related assets that once they did launch a consumer version of hololens they could just drop them all in and have these great things but microsoft is clearly clearly moving in a different direction uh, microsoft store in london 
is opening up. Actually, it's already open and they launched a collaboration with some colorful skins for the Surface product line. I personally do not like them and would never buy them, although I'm always more of a plain vanilla kind of guy. I mean, <laughs> I'm wearing a blue shirt and I always have pretty basic stuff on. Um, they're like floral and flowery. It's just not my thing. It does look very British though, and that makes sense for that market because it looks like all the wallpapers uh, that they typically have. So uh, moving on to the gaming news. So if you've been waiting for Minecraft Earth, I think that I think we're going to see that sooner rather than later. The, the, the pieces that on the back end that need to start taking place to make that a publicly available beta are starting to fall into place. So I don't exactly know when it's coming, but I would think it's arriving sooner rather than later. Um, this one actually has me very interested. This week, Mi or Microsoft, Nintendo announced the Switch Lite, and you can go find tons of videos and hands-on all that good stuff with it. But basically, it's a Nintendo Switch for 199 bucks, but you lose the ability to dock it and do all that stuff. I am very interested in this product. I've been tempted to buy a Switch for a while, especially when I have heavy travel seasons. Um, but this might be like the sweet spot because I don't need the docking. I don't need anything. Like for me, I need a switch light to play on the back of a plane. That is where I would utilize something like that. And um, yeah, I, that might be the one that finally gets me to, to jump over. If you can get it to like 149 with like a toss in Mario or something like that, that would be pretty good. Which brings up another question. Has anybody, did, do you guys know of anybody that has bought the all digital edition Xbox One? I'm still waiting to kind of see how this one shakes out. Microsoft had some pretty ambitious sales goals for this device. Um, I don't think they're gonna materialize because they're missing a lot of the components like the gaming trade-in and all that good stuff. And I'm curious if anybody's actually bought this. I, I, I'm just curious, that is all, that is all. Uh, Microsoft is shipping an update to the Xbox, the Xbox back here. Um, that allows you to enable Play Later, which is effectively a listing of games in Game Pass, which, by the way, is a really good deal. I've finally jumped over that hurdle and signed up. Actually, I just converted my Xbox Live Gold to over all that stuff for a buck. And, yeah, it's kind of hard to turn that down. Um, but basically, it allows you to set up a whole bunch of games, and if you're wanting to play them, that way you don't have to go back and search and hunt and peck. Uh, when you are looking for a new game, you can just go back to that. Um, and I had to mute my device, which you'll hear in a second. So Xbox has new Alexa skills headed to new markets. So if you, you've been really disappointed that you couldn't use the Amazon device with your uh, Xbox, you, you'll now be able to do that in a lot more markets. If you're curious, if your specific market is included, make sure to go check out that post on the Xbox Wire. Now, we're going to jump into the questions here because... That is always my favorite part. Refresh the thread, which I always throw up on Threat.com, typically the Thursday before. And so we got a handful of them here. Let us just dive in. Team 56 says, is Microsoft going to scrap the Lockhart board or are they planning to use it for something else? You were sure that the Lockhart console is dead, but we're a little inconclusive about the board itself from what I remember. Is it going to be used for Azure desktop? So I think you're mixing and matching two different things here. So Lockhart was a totally next gen thing, had its own custom board and all that stuff. I believe what you were referring to is that Microsoft has a revision of the Xbox One S board. I believe it's called Xbox One S E potentially that they are going to start utilizing later this year. And I think it's nothing more than just a cost reduction of the physical board inside the Xbox, right? They do this from time to time. And this is how they're gonna lower the price point make, right? We get efficiencies and processor improvements and all that good stuff so they can take that board, make it for cheaper. That is what I had heard is coming in the second half of this year and was gonna be potentially included in the next wave of refreshes for xCloud, right? More boards, less cost, that's a good win for everybody. And one of the questions that comes up all the time is why is Microsoft throwing these Xbox One S boards into xCloud? Why aren't they going Scarlet or Xbox One X? Here's why, here's exactly why. They are the cheapest boards to get up and running. Microsoft doesn't need the power yet, right? You start easy, you start with what's the least expensive to scale out, Xbox One S boards, and then you ramp up the complexity. That is why you do it, because why would you throw a whole bunch of Xbox One X boards in there and then it not work as you would expect? Then you've invested all that money. So you start with the cheapest boards you have, and then once you're comfortable with that level of performance, then you start turning things up to make it better and better and better. But you start easy, and it's not easy, but you start simple and then ramp up the complexity. Complexity meaning a higher, higher refresh rates, higher um, streaming capabilities, right? 1080p, 4K, and that kind of stuff. So there you go. Uh, BTR producer says, hi, Brad. Have you heard anything about the rumor Microsoft webcams that we heard about a year ago? I don't think it was a year ago, but it was definitely earlier this year. I'm very keen to update my old Microsoft Life Cam Studio. That is an aging beast. Wondered if these 4K were coming anytime soon. So I don't 
know exactly when they're coming. I believe they're called Aruba was one of them. There's another name for them. But they definitely were on a roadmap for Microsoft to ship consumer-related webcams. The only thing we know of is that there is an event-related uh, Surface hardware for the October timeframe. That may not be a bad time for Microsoft to announce such things. I mean, if you go look at the camera that attaches to the newest generation Surface Hub, the Surface Hub 2X, it's just a USB-C camera. There, there, I don't think there's, there's nothing inside that piece of hardware that enables that camera to be something special. It's the camera itself is just USB Type-C, and that is what I expect that they'll ship, just a consumer or a non-hub variant of it. And I very much am very, well, I shouldn't say, I'm very curious to see what happens if you just took that camera and just plugged it into a regular old laptop. I bet it would work. I bet it would. So, uh, Eric Palm says, do you or Paul do much grilling the sermons? I grill all the time. Um, when it's slow in the tech world. Also, you and Paul mentioned about getting a Switch Lite. If you were to pick one up, what Nintendo exclusives would you pay on the, uh, the Switch Lite first? Um, Breath of the Wild is probably the one that would get me to jump into that platform. Always got to go with anything Mario as well. Mario Kart looks really good. And then just the Mario games itself. I haven't played a, a good Mario game in a while. Mostly because I haven't bought any Nintendo hardware in a while. Um, full stop, the last hardware I bought was the Nintendo Wii. So I've missed out on a lot of handheld stuff. I got a lot of catching up to do. Mostly because I play... Like, here's my, my gaming mentality, right? If I'm at home, I'm playing Xbox more than likely, um, like PUBG, Apex Legends, or whatever, with friends. When I would use a Switch Lite is when I'm on the back of a plane um, flying to events. In the springtime, I travel a lot, um, four or five different locations, right? Vacations and all that stuff. That is when I would use it. And so, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll wait till Christmas time and see. I think my wife would kill me if I bought another console for the house, but I'm very interested in the Switch Lite. As for grilling, we grill two, three, four times a week, you know, just fire out the barbie, if you will, and just put different various fruits, well, not so much fruits, but definitely veggies and meats and all that good stuff on the grill. Uh, Palugatha says, if both Windows Lite and Windows have a taskbar, how can you use different how can you differentiate between the two? Is it possible with C shell and windows becoming modular that the option for a dock will be present because it, it seems perfect for a, for a hybrid type device. So here's how they, they differentiate it currently. You can go look, I've got some mockups and there's other people with screenshots of it. Uh, it looks a lot more like the Chrome OS launcher, but it's more centered on the screen, if you will. And that is one of the bigger ways. Now, I think we're going to see some continued evolution of the UA, UI design differentiating features. That is just what I have seen so far. It is still in the early days of light, although I am hearing that 20H1 is the current target. Um, things have shifted a little bit, and I think Edge might actually have played into that. Then he goes on to say, also, Google's strengths are Search, YouTube, and Maps. Why copy Chrome OS if these are what make that platform compelling? I don't know if copying Chrome OS... The reason why they're copying Chrome OS is because it's doing very well in education. And it, it's basically, it's not basically, but it feels stateless. Meaning like if once you shut that lid and reopen, it kind of feels like a brand new machine every single time. And that is what Microsoft is trying to get towards. Not so much the YouTube maps and search. It's more so that off and on functionality, the, the low overhead. You think about your smartphone, right? You never think about reformatting or reflashing your smartphone. It just kind of works. That is what they're going to. Windows isn't quite there, but light is hopefully going to be a giant step towards that direction. NGC224 says, is there a chance Microsoft will talk anything remotely inspiring uh, at Microsoft Inspire next week? Well, I think it's going to depend on what side of the coin you fall on. If you're a partner, there's going to be things like Azure uh, Lighthouse that might be interesting. There's some other like modern desktop stuff that's floating around that might be interesting, but it's not going to be any way, shape or form a consumer related event. So don't, I would not expect them to come out and announce any Surface hardware or anything of that. Mr. PKI says, two part question. Windows Lite going to support Android apps? This is one of the big unknowns. This is a good question. There's been rumors and speculation that Microsoft is considering bringing Android apps to Windows Lite. A lot of mixed opinions on this, depending on who you are. I think you have to kind of recognize that Microsoft is throwing in the towel on creating its own app store, right? UWP is what it is. It's, it's Schrodinger's UWP, right? It's here, but it's not here at the same time. Are they going to support Android apps? I personally would be in favor of it. The reason why I say that is for Microsoft, it's more important to have the OS and hardware than it is to have the app store. They've tried multiple times to launch an app store. It doesn't work. They've, they, it doesn't work. The model has not 
materialized in a way that has become substantial for Microsoft that invokes a lot of investment. Um, it, it's not just Microsoft. You can look at the Mac App Store. It's the same kind of scenario. There's a reason why Apple is moving towards bringing iPad apps uh upstream if you will i know there's other reasons too but the the app store on the mac isn't anything fabulous and microsoft is, is even worse than that so the question becomes for microsoft what's more important having an app store or having an os that can run apps and just be everything to everyone you know make your own decision there about what you think is more important uh, and then he says if yes is the next mobile platform from Microsoft going to be based on Windows Lite? I don't think we're going to see a, a mobile platform like a phone uh, in a while. If they do one, I could actually see them building one on Android before they would try to maybe go mobile with Windows again because that was an expensive adventure. Expensive adventure. Drunken Git says, what are your thoughts on the Switch Lite? Um, well, I, I think it's awesome. I think, right? More options, better gaming, um, easier to use and consume. Especially I, the, the big thing that i like about the switch it's called a switch but it doesn't really switch anymore they should have just called it the stable or something i don't know um anyways whatever uh so <laughs> why did i even say that the thing i like about the switch is that it's going to do one thing and one thing well mobile gaming and that is what i like about it right it's not trying to be the be all end all i don't need any of the other features i really don't i i, I don't so to me it's great uh scott Cool says, uh, if Microsoft is no longer putting any major effort into UWP, what do you think their next major move goal will be? The next major move goal is going to be trying to convince people to use Lite. That is absolutely the next thing on the agenda. PWAs and great are all for all types of PWs are not great for all types of apps. Yet. Fully agree. For example, um, I'm a very heavy video editor. A PWA is not going to suffice for that. I need something with native integration so that I can tap into the, all the cores on the CPU and just make it a, a, as efficient as possible. It already takes long enough to encode a video, and PWAs are not there yet. Video edit or photo editing is probably very similar, I would imagine. Uh, compare the OneNote UWP to the OneNote Web Client, for example, and getting developers to adopt JavaScript as their primary development tool Windows 8 went over like a lead balloon. He is absolutely correct. Are we looking at an eventual Blazor plus Electron future? Keep in mind, Microsoft now owns Electron since they bought GitHub. This seems like for years for them to create feature parity uh, with their existing UI frameworks. I don't see anything but UWP being ready for the new Windows Core Lite if they're launching next year. Yeah, I... Microsoft hasn't really provided a lot of clear direction on UWP. I know there's going to be a lot of people saying, hey, it's not dead, but it's also not really just getting the investment. So there's two ways to look at it. Is UWP going to just go away overnight? Absolutely not. Is Microsoft going to continue to invest like they had and try to force everyone into the store with UWP? Absolutely not. So uh, as a developer starting a new Windows project right, right now, I feel like any framework I bet to build Windows apps is losing long-term desire. Um, and I'm going to be destined to rewrite it. You're not wrong, Scott. Scott, that's actually a very interesting point that if you are starting a new Windows development project, what framework or methodology should you go with? Microsoft will tell you, go use any of them. But as we know with things like Silverlight and UWP appears to be going the same way, uh, it can be a tricky choice. .NET has some, I don't, .NET's definitely not going away, um, but th there's a lot of options but which one's the best for you? I can't help you with that not knowing enough about your project. PWAs are a, a safe bet, but to, to his point, they're not great for everyone and, and they're only good for certain type, types of tasks. So without knowing more, I, it's hard to pinpoint you which way to go, but I do wish you the best of luck. And I'm actually curious to see what you're building. If it's um, you know something worth worthwhile, let me know and I'll try to hype it up as much as I can. So uh, everybody else, thanks for dropping questions in this week. As always, that is my favorite part of the, uh, the, the, the weekly podcast. To everybody else, have yourselves a wonderful Friday and we'll catch you right back here next time.